What were the scores of your practice exams? Were the scores all over the place or did you see consistent improvement? Don't lose your preparedness in the sections you scored well. <clears throat> Anki, I can't stress enough how important it is to review those tests. Hey there, pre-meds. I'm Emery the Memory Cat, your personal guide to navigating the MCAT. And today, we're gonna talk about retaking the MCAT. First off, let me reassure you, it's totally normal to retake this beast of a test. About 40% of MCAT test takers are doing it for the second or even third time. And the good news, most retakers see their scores improve. If you aren't satisfied with your MCAT score, and let's face it, are you ever truly satisfied with your grades? I'm gonna show you how to retackle the MCAT so you'll see a boost in your score. And we're going to use soap. No, not that soap. I'm a cat, I take a bath with my tongue. I'm talking about the acronym Subjective, Objective, Assessment, and Plan. In the clinic, SOAP is a framework for shepherding a patient from illness to wellness. But today, we're gonna use it as a framework for increasing your MCAT score. You'll find links down in the description for everything we talk about. So let's start with the S of SOAP, subjective. In the clinic, this includes the patient's chief complaint, like chest pain. And your chief complaint? That MCAT score. Subjective findings will usually include the patient's symptoms, their medical history, and what is helping or exacerbating their symptoms. For you, think of subjective like a snapshot of your life when you last took the MCAT. How were you studying for the MCAT? How much dedicated study time were you doing every day? Were you juggling a job, research, or maybe a bunch of coursework? How did you feel on the test day itself? Take the time to evaluate how you approached the test in the past, because this is an opportunity to take a different approach this time around. And listen, I know I'm just a cartoon cat, but take what I'm about to say very seriously. In the same way you wouldn't be mad or disappointed in your patient for getting sick, don't be mad at yourself just because your MCAT score was lower than expected. Cut yourself some slack. This test is harder than catching this little red dot thingy. What is that thing? Next, we have the O in SOAP. Objective. Clinically, this is, well, the objective information about a patient. Their vitals, labs and imaging, exam findings, it's the hard data. So, what data do you have for the MCAT? Well, you probably have one of these. Ask yourself, how does your score compare to the average MCAT score of admitted students at the schools you want to apply to? How much of an increase do you want to get? What sections did you do well versus the ones that need a lot more improvement? Other helpful objective information can include how much time you spent studying. Are we talking hundreds of hours, maybe less? What were the scores of your practice exams? Were the scores all over the place or did you see consistent improvement? And I'll say this again, there's a reason why it's called objective. It's a number on a sheet. It doesn't mean anything about you as a person or whether you're smart enough or good enough or any of the things that constantly run through pre-meds heads. All you have is your current score, your target score, and the gap in between. That's it. Which brings us to asking, what contributed to that gap? AKA the A in SOAP which stands for assessment. In the clinic, this is the summary of the patient's case that you present to the attending during rounds, along with a list of potential diagnoses for what could be causing the patient's chief complaint. In this case, it's a summary of your problem and why your score fell short. For example, Emery is a four-year-old kitten superstar who comes in with a chief complaint of a 492 on the MCAT and a 120 on CARS, which are well below the target of 510 plus for her desired schools. A key factor contributing to this includes being unable to sit still long enough to study, let alone take a seven and a half hour exam. Also, she can't read and therefore didn't do enough content review or take enough practice exams. Okay, this assessment might sound silly, but I think you get the point. Your assessment can range from not doing enough content review or practice exams, to test taking nerves getting the best of you, to not having developed the stamina to sit through a long test. Again, you wanna be as logical as possible about this assessment. Otherwise, those creepy thoughts start coming in about how you'll never be good enough to be a doctor or how you're a disappointment to your parents. Get that out of your head. The MCAT doesn't test for that. 
So why are those thoughts taking up valuable real estate in your brain, am I right? Also, assessment isn't just a one-time thing. Maybe you make rapid progress on one subject, reassess, and then think your time would be better spent with a different subject area. For this reason, taking timed practice MCAT exams and doing practice questions is so important. We'll go more in depth about practice tests in a second, but just remember this. Don't stop assessing yourself. The last letter in SOAP is P for plan. This is where the magic happens. In the assessment, you got to describe the problem and what you think is causing it. And now, you get to solve it. In the hospital, your plan's all about what tests or steps you'll take to figure out what's going on and how to treat your patient. For the MCAT, it's basically your game plan for what you're gonna do differently this time around. Let's say your assessment said your score was below a 500 and you concluded it was due to not doing enough content review. A potential plan might include doing another pass through the most high yield topics of the MCAT or doing targeted review of the concepts you feel you're the weakest at. At the same time, don't lose your preparedness in the sections you scored well, <clears throat> Anki, but try to economize and spend most of your hours reviewing the subjects where you fell behind, <clears throat> still Anki. Next, maybe your score was in the low 500s and you think it's due to your test taking skills. That might mean taking more practice exams and taking time to review them and see what specific items you got wrong. I can't stress enough how important it is to review those tests. In fact, you should probably spend more time reviewing missed questions than you spend actually taking the practice tests. Figure out why you missed the question. Maybe it was a knowledge gap, maybe the question writer tricked you, or maybe you were just running out of time. Resources like UWorld and Sketchy will give you facts and info detailing why certain answer choices are correct or incorrect. This should be like catnip for you. God, I love catnip. Either way, you'll probably be doing some combination of content review and practice exams. And a good rule of thumb is to spend one third of your time doing content review and two thirds doing sample questions and practice tests. Depending on the length of time you have and the score gap you have to close, prioritize appropriately. If you only have one month and only need an extra three points to hit the score range for the school of your dreams, look at where you missed points on your last attempt. For example, many students say the easiest section to score 132 is psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior. So if you have room to improve in that section, work on getting all those gimme points before you worry about the points you dropped in cars. And there's a condensed study guide for the psych social section that many top scorers swear by in the description. Let's say, however, you do need to improve your score on the dreaded cars section. If that's the case, your plan might be to go over some more cars passages and maybe take more time to read long form articles and journals that'll test your reading comprehension. But also, don't forget your foundations. First, you wanna create a solid study schedule. You can source any of the readily available calendars from Sketchy, Kaplan, or even the pre-med subreddit as a framework. Second, allot enough time for study. The AAMC recommends 200 to 400 hours of study time for the MCAT. But of course, it varies since you're doing a retake and the amount of time you put in depends on how much more studying you need to hit your target score, along with how much time you can realistically set aside for studying, especially if you have other commitments. Also, money. The test is already sending you back 345 bucks. And when you start thinking about all the third-party resources out there, you could rack up thousands in charges. Figure out how much you can budget for study resources. And to spare your piggy bank a smashing, only purchase the resources that'll target your weak spots. Kaplan, Sketchy, and Princeton Review all cover content review. Jack Weston and Sketchy both offer cars practice and strategies. UWorld has solid Cubing coverage. And if you haven't already used up those AAMC practice exams, make sure you take all of them this time around. Our next video is all about choosing the best resource for your needs, so check it out. Finally, don't forget to build in time to rest and reset. A tired brain retains less information, processes stressors less effectively, and is just slower. Plan to sleep more than you think you need. That's why I sleep 18 hours a day. And that's the SOAP note for your MCAT retake. Just like you'll use SOAP notes to manage your future patients, you can take your MCAT score from struggling to thriving in no time. Scrub in and let us know in the comments how it goes.